And I think that I already give you the leadership to to Thank you. To Did we start, start? Ilnur? Is everyone ready? Yes, we should wait for Piotr for yes, Piotr a couple of minutes. Yeah, But maybe you can help everyone. People with yeah, kind of opportunity to listen to us. My name is Ignor, 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 but I think Ignor, I'm the colleague of Kirill and many other yeah, people who put this event together. I'm working also for Smena, a contemporary art center. Kirill yesterday was asking for an extra minute to tell in detail about our projects. I hope you remember his yesterday's presentation, but today... We shall be speaking Когда about, только рождалась эта конференция, еще там в первом черновике, идея этой конференции, звучала мысль о том, что культурные институты, каким бы они ни были, где бы они ни работали, это не просто рассказ об их проектах, а обмен опытом, несмотря на то, что это, естественно, тоже очень важно, но еще и эти культурные институции репрезентуют ту территорию, на которой они находятся, и это для нас тоже было безусловно целью этой конференции, чтобы мы рассказали друг другу о тех географических точках, где мы находимся, о какой связи эти культурные институты находятся с местами, где они находятся, поэтому мы Сегодня хотели бы Therefore, обсудить немного today, и эту тему. Uh, и я вчера очень внимательно well. следил за And тем, как проходили доклады и обсуждения, и у многих выступлениях проскакивала тема путешествий, несмотря на то, что немного иронично обсуждать перемещение по миру в ситуации. Я хотел бы продолжить эту тему и в нашем выступлении, в нашем обсуждении и предложить каждому из участников And, uh, прокомментировать несколько like картин, которые я для них заготовил. Об этом мы вернемся уже позже скоро. Uh, я думаю, мы можем приступать. Я бы хотел начать с Кирилла, моего коллеги из Центра Северного Казани. Я ведь могу сделать демонстрацию From the Center of Contemporary Culture Smena in Kazan. Can I share my screen, please? Мне нужно открыть системные настройки, мне пишет. Секунду, Секунду простите. простите. Sorry, I need just to do a few clicks and settings. Uh, моя идея была в том, что uh, вчера Кирилл рассказывал, was, например, о путешествиях uh, по example, миру через uh, книги и их содержание. Uh, Юлия показывала, теперь видно? Julia was talking Google about карты перемещения из точки А в точку Б, в точку Б, которые сопровождались рассказами участников, это было очень круто знать, где именно и как мы можем добраться из одной точки в другую, глядя на эту карту. Сегодня я выбрал как такую точку, через которую мы будем отправляться в разные точки мира, через гербы и флаги этих мест. Возможно, это вам покажется немного глупо, потому что не всегда... I think it might seem silly because not always these emblems, which are so pompous and official, uh, show the actual content of the territory. Sometimes these uh, emblems show nothing of the territory, but uh, maybe in this particular sign there is a key to understanding of particular territory. So let us try and do that. Maybe it will be a curious experience. I hand over the floor to Kirill and I'm showing him the emblem, the coat of arms of Kazan. Kirill, what do you see on this image? Tell me, at the Rorschach test. Kirill, are you with us? Kirill, что видишь на картинке? Kirill, я не слышу, к сожалению. Kirill, тебя, по-моему, не слышно. Я тоже не слышу. Пожалуйста. Все, теперь меня слышно? Да, да. Yes, do excuse me. Да, здесь я, конечно, должен какую-то сделать небольшую ремарку, звездочку, чтобы как-то это не... Выглядел коррумпированно, so uh, что в своем коллеге мы постарались совсем коротко обсудить, безусловно, мы касались в наших разговорах сегодняшней дискуссии, но постарались ее никак не углублять, но тем не менее... Uh, я немножко, я немножко как бы, как бы понимаю, понимаю, знаю, знаю об идее, об идее с флагами и с гербом, которые вот сейчас на ваших emblems, экранах, arms. и uh, попробую как-то ответить на этот вопрос, исходя из того, что Ильнур сказал прежде, безусловно, конечно, для нас это то, что мы видим сейчас перед глазами, это идея конференции во многом, а именно пытаться каким-то образом описать, наложить самые разные языки описания, безусловно, их масса и много на наш город, но глазами современной культуры. Contemporary Culture Institution. 
which world do you represent? So, in front of us, as you may observe, the coat of arms of Kazan. This is Zealand Black Dragon. I was yesterday telling about, you may remember, yesterday I was telling about this residency of the comics artists and graphic report artists. And one of the artists from St. Petersburg, she actually uh, made the graphic report on uh, this dragon. I was uh, telling about this yesterday, that Kazan consists of a number of layers. Some of them easily fall into the tourist logics. And if I may, I mean, you have looked quite enough on this emblem. Let me show the map of Kazan. Yes, probably it's good if every single one of us shows some sort of the map so that we understand what space we're talking about. Yeah. So a, a Google request, Kazan map. Here it is. So the heart is Moscow. I don't know why Moscow is the heart. It's accidental. I mean, probably I was highlighting something as my favorite here, but my heart is definitely in Kazan. Anyway, here's Nizhny Novgorod, the Tikha uh, workshop in the middle between Moscow and Kazan. And here is Kazan standing on the vast Volga River. So historically, it's always broken apart into two pieces. I will return to the emblem that Ilnur has, Ilnur has shown. So, and the city is split by Kazanka River, which is a wide river. It is the influx of the Volga River. Volga is one of the largest rivers in Russia and in the world. So the city can be split down the center of the city. This is the channel. Again, the center is split into two equal parts. You see, this is the channel. Bulag channel. And Smyrna, so that you understand, you see, this is the, uh, the shop and here's our building right here. So, a few obvious binaries in the city. There are two major nations living in Kazan. And that is the vibe of the city. We have the Tatar and the Russians. So there are two religions, uh, Muslim religion and Orthodox Christianity. After the conquest of Kazan uh, in the 16th century, when uh, Kazan became the part of contemporary Russia, right here where the Smyrna, there was the sort of uh, Tatar ghetto back in the imperial era. The city was able to break out of that ghetto by the end of the 19th century only. And here you should understand that the emblem that Ilnur has shown, let me go back to it once more. Yes, these things can be so diverse. This is the emblem of Kazan. This winged tiger is actually the emblem of the Republic of Tatarstan, Tatar, Tatarstan. So it's like the Canton. The Republic of Tatarstan is the original unit, like Canton. Uh, and uh, Kazan is the capital of Tatarstan. So... This creature is a mythical creature. There is, of course, Tatar mythology. I was talking about this small book, the mythology of Tat Tatar of Kazan, that we have released. And uh, the mythology of uh, Tatar of Kazan is very well described. It's well integrated into the culture of the city and the region overall. With the emblem, there are some frictions. We see it again and again. It's everywhere on the administrative buildings, even the buildings uh, before the revolution. Uh, 
There are different versions of it, like this one. You see, it's everywhere. I mean, but Zealand is kind of a blank spot. Blank spot. Um, it's under-researched. We don't know much about it. The citizens don't know about it. Even though people are quite knowledgeable about the Tatar tradition. Let me show you one more hooligan problem. Kazan before the revolution. Before the revolution in 1917, had this Eastern University, the Eastern University, for quite a long time. And we had tremendous people there from all of the Russian Empire, students who were going to study in Kazan. Let me do some name dropping so you would understand the power. We had Leo Tolstoy. Mr. Khlebnikov, Rodchenko, and this is only culture, Sergei Aksakov, the famous writer. And this list goes on and on, not only amongst uh, um, cultural activists and artists. There were so many people studying, but uh, uh, what sort of um, trace they've left? That's a different sort of questions. So, we had this uh, folk research, regional research. We in Kazan care a lot about our region. We're not trying to uh, alienate it. This is a project that cannot be replicated in many ways. I mean, we're studying this local lore trying to see ourselves as the institution that makes a contribution into this study, particularly in our territory. So we're often, often overlooking not the future, but we're looking over the past. And of course the city, again, small um, foray into the history of the city. It used to be the university city and the university was a significant driver for growth of the city. After the World War II, during World War II, they evacuated to Kazan from the west of the country. They evacuated a number of factories. And it's not just uh, the transfer. A lot of people, uh, a lot of highly professional engineers and researchers move to the region and stay here. And they start teaching in the university. And in the second half of the 20th century, we experienced a tremendous boom. The second university revival, I would call it, a sort of uh, university renaissance. In my opinion, it moves into the backdrop at the moment, and we see Kazan as a sort of tourist venue. I don't know whether our Swiss colleagues know or have known anything about Kazan. I have prepared a link, and this link is available also in English. Yes, in the chat, there's a couple of questions about Lenin. Could you tell about how Lenin studied at the University of Kazan? Oh, yeah, Lenin. Uh, is it Russian questions or Swiss questions? Lucy is asking, Lenin, what about Lenin? Okay, Lenin. Vladimir Lenin. He did study in Kazan like three months, uh, the Faculty of Law. His family is born from the city of Simbirsk, also on Volga. Today, the city called Ulyanovsk, after the, the initial last name of Lenin, which is Ulyanov. His, he changed his last name. So now the city where Lenin is born is called Ulyanovsk. It's also close to Kazan on Volga. Lenin was not able to enter uh, the university in Moscow or St. Petersburg because um, Lenin's brother was a political activist who was executed. So Lenin was not allowed to study in Moscow or St. Pete. So Lenin lived in Kazan uh, and studied for three months at the Faculty of Law. Right away, he starts participating in some sort of Marxist groups and circles. And three months after studying in Kazan, Lenin does quite an irrational feat. He participates 
in student right, not even a riot, kind of a gathering. After that, they dismiss him from the university. Lenin moves away. So Lenin is expelled. He moves away to his uncle's country house near to Kazan. So it's a soap opera, as you may hear. That's it. That's the whole biography of Lenin in Kazan. Nothing to talk about. No revolution. That's the end of the 19th century. Lenin is super young. He's like a, here's like a student. And that's curious. Trying to describe Kazan as the city where irrational things are happening, where people do irrational deeds with the butterfly effect. I hope I have been able to answer the question uh, about Lenin. And yes, we observe right now. Yeah, I wanted to tell briefly about Mr. Bulat Galeev and the so-called group Ni Prometheus. Ni is like the R&D facility in Russian. R&D facility Prometheus. This is the unity, which was a pioneer in this. This was the pioneer of video and media art. They began working in the 60s. They initially, they were this actual R&D center uh, under the auspices of the um, aviation uh, university, aviation faculty of Kazan University. And they began researching sound, visuals, lighting. They were designing city celebrations. This is the Spasskaya Tower of our Kremlin. And we see when uh, the bells are ringing, there's light, lighting. They also designed the Circus of Kazan with lighting. It looks like the UFO. The flying sorcerer they were making this lighting and sound performances in 60s and 70s and 80s i will send you the link to this uh uh prometheus r d center prometheus it describes well the history of this uh Ni prometheus and bulat galeev who was leader of the circle i mean these guys were doing some r d like creating this computers, which you can see now. This is a computer. This is the machine for cosmonauts, so that cosmonauts would not get tired and could watch this um, changing visuals to relax. This is actually the screensaver. This is the generator of screensaver for cosmonauts to look at it and get relaxed. When USSR fall down, uh, the country collapsed and broke into a number of nations. Uh, uh, Ulad Galiev began doing some political art, political media art. Uh, he really had some respect for the Soviet. He was a supporter of the Soviet Union, actually. This is the first person who, in 1989, the first Russian person who visited Ars Electronica, the first Russian or even Soviet artist who visited Ars Electronica ever. That happened in 1987. You imagine, uh, 1989, sorry, 1989, yes. Recently, we hosted the residency for the Swiss artist Alan Bogan. Alan Bogana, sorry, probably know the guy. And uh, we got to know Alan in Zurich. Our colleague Robert put us together. So Alan was making a project dedicated to dedicated to Ni Prometheus and Bulat Galeev. This was, this was in a way an homage, but with the integration of the pieces by Bulat Galeev and Ni Prometheus, their developments. It looked overall like this. Uh, all of it happened in Smyrna. I will send you the link. I mean, there is some very rich history behind it. And there's a number of illustrations here. This is a huge publishing mine. This is the center for experimental uh, local lore studies. I mean, we live amongst um, exceptionally rich history. And uh, I would like to return to the connection to the emblem through these historic circumstances. 
For us in Smyrna, we are trying to suggest opportunities, yes, but we want also to be in the avant-garde. As much as we can, we want to, we want to highlight the problems of our surrounding reality, asking the question to the city, to our audience, formulate, uh, set the questions. I remember that the news on social networks, uh, we have this popular messenger called Telegram Messenger, and there are micro blogs in there, not only messaging services. So it's like Facebook, but within a messenger. So I'm looking at the news and on a daily basis, I see and I read about Kazan and they say that Kazan is the tourist capital of Russia. Everybody's saying about that. There's uh, an improving tourist infrastructure. There are like scooters, places opening, all of the stuff to create comfortable environments specifically for tourists. I have been thinking about this for a year. The emblem is not going away anywhere. It will be static, but still there's some ambiguity around it. You catch the person in the street and ask about Zealand dragon. What is it? Where is the Zealand mountain with that dragon? What can you tell about this black dragon? If you even open Russian Wikipedia, I don't know what the English Wikipedia says. If we open Russian page in the Wikipedia, there's nothing decent on Zealand. We don't know anything about him. We have a short wiki page about this mythological creature that represents our entire city. And now we're constantly facing the problem that university infrastructure is actually falling into the backdrop. Even though there is now a boom of cultural institutions in Kazan, there is this new national library opening. The giant number of projects, indeed, on the one hand. On the other hand, tourist infrastructure that in a way blocks blocks um, the development. I mean, it's hard to compare with Venice or Paris with the booming history and tourist infrastructure. Even though we have beautiful tourist infrastructure in Kazan, but there is often a problem with tourist cities in Russia. We don't have cultural scene or cultural life in tourist centers in Russia. That is just, just the way it is. Из чего культурных, каких культурных элементов состоит как бы история конкретно нашего города? People start to forget the cultural elements of the city. Tourism changes the city. It will make Kazan more of a party place, where culture will be under pressure. So I have some anxiety there. The city does experience a cultural boom. The city is um, experience constant, constant oscillation. As answering the Ilnur's question about what is this emblem for us? This emblem for us is a problem. If we take a look at everything around us in the city related to our identity and this emblem is our identity by all means and if we question it i don't know how about other russian cities but but in kazan we're seeing that this that's quite a hard question right into the face about us 
about the cultural institution, about our institutional development. I'm saying again and again that I may be a hooligan here, but I do believe that this is some sort of speculation, a tool that helps us to ask a question and inform onto us certain problems. I hope I have been able to ask the correct question in Nur. I hope that they understood your answer. I did. <laughs> if you have questions to Kirill, do not hesitate to ask it, uh, those questions. If you don't have any questions, we'll continue. It's up to you. You can ask questions now, you can ask questions later. Oh, I see there is a question. Yes. I wonder which year was when the emblem returned and what was before. I do not have a, the answer to that question yet, but this emblem is not going away anywhere. And after the revolution, it, it was there yet throughout the entire history of the Russian Empire. Kazan was conquested in the 16th century, in the mid 16th century. And that was very violent. They violently imbued Russian city. Tatar. The Tatar were deported to the other side of the river. So the city was experiencing some graphic changes. What happened before? Probably nothing. I mean, there's this uh, um, snow uh, cheetah, snow leopard or cheetah, not sure. You always need to dig deeper into this lore to find out about it. And we do not study this in school. We don't study this in university. I mean, nobody knows about it. Uh, there is a ton of legends about the city, but we kind of are not aware of the deeper meaning of them. And we yet face them on a daily basis. And I can barely say a couple of phrases about them. That's why it's not that I'm like super smart and everybody around is stupid. No, we coexist with these problems on a daily basis. These are mind problems as well. This is a global problem for some cultural uh, unfinishedness. Я был в Казани, и сейчас я думал о своих впечатлениях об этом городе. I cultural understatement, innuendo. Yes, Kirill, I, I went to Kazan and I remembered this thing, which I often say when I guide tours in my city of Nizhny Novgorod. I ask people about the hashtags. And these are kind of the cliches about my city. So I suggest you find out about hashtags uh, about Kazan as well. And here's what I want to ask you. What sort of hashtags would you give to Kazan? If, if I may ask the question. This is a great idea. In addition, I suggest to people who were yesterday talking to us, I suggest uh, let's pass on the baton and try to describe our places this way, this way. I mean, hopefully we'll see one another in our cities. And take, for example, the emblem of Zhelesnagorsk. Kola, you're with us. So I traveled to Zhelesnagorsk, for example, and I was absolutely certain that it has a very different emblem. Let me show it. Let me show it. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, show it, because um, it's fabulous. And the text on the emblem is just fabulous. No, Kola, I want to tell about that you have a different problem with that album, uh, emblem, sorry. 
Ой, Будапешт это Красноярск. Yeah. I was going to Железногорск, and I was completely sure that this is the emblem of Железногорск, the bear in the atom breaking apart the atom. The bear within the atom tearing apart the atom. While it's not the emblem of your Zhelyaznagorsk, there is a different Zhelyaznagorsk in the city of, in the region of Krasnoyarsk in the far east of Russia. That's the point. So, let us be very attentive with the uh, hashtags. I'm about to wrap up. I know I've been uh, speaking for too long. There is a number of ways to describe this, and the question is um, which button we have to push. Tourist uh, description, um, local lore-based description. But one of the hashtags, for example, is Moscow. The way to describe Kazan is hashtag Moscow, because Kazan is very well oriented to Moscow, competing to Moscow in many ways, and sometimes winning in that competition. In this virtual uh, struggle, race, I'd say. I will not be talking about absolutely obvious things, but the second point that I was talking about in the beginning, all of these things can be described by this binary approach, this split into two in the city. Everything in our city can be split into two. Can be split into. But our mission is to, is to stop this um, bind duality, culture, not culture, true, false, black, white. We're trying to avoid the, that and run away from it. So here are my hashtags then. Okay, there are some questions here for Elena. I can see the raised hand. Jakob? Okay, so we're done. Okay, no more questions here. I suggest I suggest we add some Swiss cities as well. So if Marcel is ready, we would move on. And for me, it would be really catching because at the step where we could see coat of arms and a flex where we are, I can see different pictures and I can choose some pictures for you. So you could start your talk about the territory you are in and your relationship with that particular place. So I would share my screen. So I understand that one of these pictures is coat of arms of your municipal. So this is like a canton. Yeah. So coat yeah, of the, arms. The so am I am I right? Yeah. The first. This is the um, emblem of the municipality, the L for Lichtensteig. So that's the emblem for the town. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the emblem of the canton, the canton of St. Gallen. You see these aches and this rod bundle. Can we look and understand what is that about the uh, canton and municipality, about the place where you live? Or... Yeah, I mean, I can, maybe I can, uh, because I, I don't have so much historical knowledge like you guys, <laughs> but... <laughs> I thought, um, yeah, to just maybe quickly share my screen and to go on um, to see where I am at the moment. So do you see yeah. this Google Earth? So I just right here, Lichtensteig. Everybody, if you could do that as well. And then we zoom in. <clears throat> so here is Switzerland. This is the bound. These are the boundaries, the yellow. And so in northeast, there is this small town called Lichtensteig. And now we're going to zoom in a bit. So, 
So here is the small town in the center of a valley called Tockenburg. <clears throat> and uh, to zoom in a bit closer. So here on this side, this is the river called Tuo. For the artists that stay at our residency, it's actually a nice place, especially in the summer, to take a swim. Um, and so to see on a map, we have actually two locations. So here, where my hand is now, this is the town hall. And so the so-called cultural center called Rathaus für Kultur. And it was, um, <clears throat> It was founded in the same time when we founded the residency. So like the team is more or less the same, but it's uh, two projects with two goals. So here is the residency. Here is the shared apartment where the artists live. And here on just some uh, minutes walk where my head is now, there is the old gym hall. So this is the shared studio. And now I'm going to close here um, and I'm going to, because I understand it's really literally, so to go with you on a short walk, if you like so. So I'm going to stop here the screen sharing and so let me just switch my phone and just a moment. We are promised to have a tour at the place where Marcel is, but he has to switch to the phone to do that. So that's why we have to wait a few seconds. So, do you see me? Yes, that's great. So <clears throat> I'm here. So this is you on screen. And <laughs> during these two days, I'm sitting here on this table, so we are on the second floor next to this place. Here's our small library. It's, um, for example, here, let's take this book here. It's of an artist that was here uh, last year, Patrick Ostrovsky. And here we can also see um, an exhibition he did in our gym hall where we are going uh, afterwards. So he stayed here for two months and he left us his book here as a reminder of him and his work. And now I just show you a bit around because um, like the, the building itself is also some kind of context for the artists. So when they arrive here, this is like the, the main place they spend the most of time here. So this is the second floor. And here on the left side, for example, there's a studio of a colleague of mine, um, Hannes. And Hannes is now working here. <laughs> he's also of the Dogger team. Um, he's a filmmaker. And um, he's uh, doing the documentation of the artists at the end of the residency. Um, yes, let's walk now a bit around. So this is one studio. There is another studio of a, um, of a local artist duo. So they rent the space and they make um, costumes for the theater. So this is kind of their work. Uh, workplace. So there is always this exchange of um, local cultural workers and the artists that come either from Switzerland or from abroad to work here. There's uh, here's a small technical room. And I'm working now here to the studio. So this is Murat, Maura and Lea of Dogo team and of the team of the community or cultural center. And upstairs, 
I asked the artists before if I can also go to have a look that you have an insight of the apartment, the shared apartment, to see how they live. So five artists at the same time are here. Um, this is uh, the bathroom, really blue, it's quite new. And when we arrived here just three years ago, it was everything offices by the municipality and we changed it to um, an apartment. So here you see three rooms. There's another one at the back. And here is the living room. Nobody's here now, everybody left. <laughs> so this is uh, actually the upper floor on <clears throat> the house. And to just have a bit of um, perspective. So here is kind of um, the view from a window down to the town. It's now um, not so cloudy. I'm happy because all these days it was rainy. Um, now it's get sunny again. And there is, this is Jan. Hello. Hey Jan. <laughs> I'm cleaning the room. I'm moving out. Yeah, he's just at the end of his residency. He's a Zurich-based artist, and that was his um, four-month stay. <laughs> um, accommodation. And now I'm just moving around um, and going to show you the outside. that you have a, a relation to the town and also to the size. So this is a former town hall, as I said, and we kind of renovated this up, by the way, back to the, to the flags. These are the cantonal flags. And this is uh, the canton of St. Gallen. So, and on the first floor, <clears throat> so you can imagine it. Um, this space, for example, is now a project space or exhibition space. And it was uh, used for offices of the municipality. So we had to kind of refurnish everything. We also made this uh, hole here, like this window. So on the other side, you see a bistro. So, and here down, there was everything covered with a carpet. So we had to take it out and to make it cozy and to make it public. Here you see now, um, so there's a show um, by a Geneva-based artist, Silva Gelewski, and he had the idea he wants to do a, a solo show. So just three weeks ago, he came to us and said, hey guys, I want to do a solo show. And it's called Dwarfs, Unicorn, and Glasses. And we said, okay, we can support you doing that. So we try to, um, we try to um, make things possible. So things meaning ideas of the artists, like shows, um, events, and so on. And so, so throughout the exhibition, like this exhibition here, this Geneva-based artist, provokes the treatment of these constructs and contradictions. So they quickly turn into good and are part of a white ideal world. So for example, this dwarf is a typical symbol for a kind of idealistic world, which he also finds here in this small town. And so also this, all the colors you see here, it's also a reference to the emblem, to the cantonal, um, emblem of St. Gallen. And it's also kind of a rule that he um, implements in his work. So I could talk much more about his work, but um, I want to move on. <laughs> I don't have so much time, I think. So this is the, actually, this is a historical room of the building, which is still used for weddings. So just right before it was a wedding. 
And here we see a dog. And it's a Grand Dane. It's the um, symbol of the region of Tockenburg. And leaving now the building a bit outside. Now there is, um, so for two weeks, there are events and also an art walk, which is not initiated by uh, the residency, but um, by the cultural center. For example, here we see a work of a collective, ethic collective, and they just hanged it up here on the ceiling. It was grounded uh, or it started four years ago um, in an exhibition I did with a collective um, that I, with the same people, I um, kind of founded the residency. So this collective actually made a work um, four years ago in a shopping mall. And we invited um, eight or seven artistic positions. We gave them thousand Swiss francs and they had three weeks time to spend all the money on a shopping mall and make art out of it. And this uh, work you see here was actually um, a flag. So it was a flag which was um, situated in kind of the public space of Wiel, which is a, a bigger town than Lichtenscheid, but uh, in the same region, the same canton. And they kind of um, reused the material to uh, make an artwork which now can be explored in the village. Town hall. Um, <clears throat> now we have some days uh, with events, concerts, readings, um, circus. So always from Thursday to Saturday, there are many events going on. And so, yeah, this is actually, it was the, like the former, um, how to say, the starting point of the UBS bank when it wasn't called UBS, it was called Schweizerischer Bank for Wein. <laughs> and here is now the municipality, the offices, where they were actually here. So, but they uh, <clears throat> had to move out because here is a really big staircase. So it's, the building is not accessible um, for people in wheelchair. And as uh, and like the municipality offices, they need to be open to everybody, all the inhabitants. So they uh, had the idea to move out and we had, we could move in with our idea of making a residency in the cultural center. And it's still not, op it's really not optimal for us as well not so accessible, but maybe we're gonna find some creative ideas to make it more accessible. And here the technicians are working. And now I'm just running a bit faster uh, to the studio. I hope I still have time, please let me know. So here I pass to the, to the local, um, Supermarkets. So here the artists go to buy food. It's called Volk. Volk Paruski Narod. Quite some cars are passing here by. And here is a shop and they sell TVs. And the artists, uh, it was also kind of a funny thing because now it's the Euro. Euro 2020, and there's a big screen. And um, we watched here um, a soccer game, but without audio, so only the image it was quite funny. But let's run now a bit with you, because sitting on the screen all the time, it's also exhausting. So it can be relaxing to run a bit. So, во-первых, мы узнали, где вы сегодня будете смотреть финал чемпионата мира. We know that we would, you would uh, see the finals for Euro 2020, and it's amazing to tell about the territory around you. And how does it influence you, the 
uh, outside world, this this city. Uh, would another city influence the workers, the artists? Would they stay the same or this territory, this location, it changes you in a way? I mean, <clears throat> it's a good question. <laughs> I mean, it's always, I mean, there's always two parts, like the biography and the perspectives that the artists bring to the residency. And the other part is the conditions which are on site. And for sure, this small town with nature, mountains really close is quite an attraction, like an attraction to the artists. So they go for walkings very often. So, and to, yeah, also to say something about the studio where we're walking now. So it's possible to work large scale and many artists that come here that normally don't work large scale, <clears throat> they start to do big paintings. So yes, for sure, like the space itself is really crucial and forms the artistic practice. <clears throat> so now we see there Louise and Marcel, they just arrived some um, two days ago. So two artists from Brussels, as you see, they with the bike. So they drove with the bike from Basel to Lichtensteig. Sportive guys. <laughs> oh, <laughs> merci. <laughs> So this is our studio. So there, um, so we serve some basic tools and uh, to, yeah, to have a possibility for the artists that they can somehow work so they can arrange themselves how they want. They're free. There's a helicopter by Arabella Hilfiger. Uh, UK artist and here on this side there's our small art school so every week children can come and uh, do how to say like work with different materials so <clears throat> I don't know for example candles or colors fabrics so a lot of different materials <clears throat> And so it's actually a great uh, workshop place as well. And sometimes we have bigger projects with cool classes. So yeah, this is um, actually really nice to have this space. Upstairs, there's another small room sometimes used for um, music rehearsals by the artists. Sometimes we have artists that have a musical uh, practice yeah. So, we could watch this room tour and street tour forever. So maybe we could combine that with questions forever. So, so let us ask the questions we would like to ask. So everyone has time. It was amazing, amazing. Just thank you very much. Maybe anyone has some questions here? I would ask the question about the hashtag. We have a hashtag. Oh. <laughs> so, Marcel, uh, what about the hashtag? Uh, you can, uh, yes, for, for your place, how you identify it. Uh huh. Mm. <laughs> Let me think. Creating as social practice, I'd say. Um, Hashtag fun moment. <laughs> um, hashtag, I don't know, art and landscape, maybe. Yeah, it's difficult. I don't know. Мне кажется достаточно. Спасибо большое. Вы можете. I think it's enough. Thank you very much.
so if you're not participating in that discussion you could write down that hashtag of these hashtags and take them into consideration so i suppose we would move on because i have i have some uh, i suppose we could go back to the Tiha Studios, so Yakov is with us and he's ready to tell us about Nizhny Novgorod. So I would ask the same question as I asked other participants as well. What is your, what the coat of arms tell you and what, what does it tell about the city maybe that we wouldn't get just even by getting into the city? So. Uh, someone from the internet just used the background, but the coat of arms itself. Okay. So, coat of arms. This is a deer. It was quite obvious. So, I googled that. What does that mean? And there were a lot of nice words about being hard, about courage about respect to the elderly and so on and so forth so you know those kind of stuff you know cleaning your teeth going to sleep before 11 two times a day but not joking here this is kind of um a historical site it was created by Yekaterina the second i suppose it's the 16th century something so the deer looks really sophisticated and before there was as far as i understand the elk i can't say that we use that a lot in Nizhny novgorod i suppose it's kind of an alternative a sarcastic symbol of Nizhny novgorod as a blue fence it's uh, like a metal fence that is covered uh, in blue that we know that the governor of the region now he's in jail <laughs> ex-governor he, he managed to cover the monuments of architect architecture using that old full blue fence as I have already told you before about the street art um, monuments that still exist in Nizhny Novgorod, the fence is changed right now. Sometimes they're demolished, sometimes they're ruined, but the deer, I suppose it's all. I, I, can't, I can't say that we waste too much time talking about the deer. I have already told you about Nizhny Novgorod because there are two river, rivers there and the opportunity to trade by water it gave uh, a big impulse to develop in terms of merchant trade because merchants they they were asking and they were ordering a lot of you know churches not for themselves but for others some properties they were hiring uh, some carpenters, so they would have some uh, some items that belong to them, you know, uh, like some carvings that only them can have. So they were visually given the impulse to the city so it was really modern and it could be compared to artists that were doing some window dressing in some street beautiness uh, Artem was talking about that this is the museum that keeps on doing its educational activities, enlightenment activities, confirming that in Nizhny Novgorod, the public is ready, specifically thanks to our museum called Arsenal. It's situated in the Nizhny Novgorod Kremlin that was built back in the 16th century. 
It's not a historic building where the uh, arsenal was placed historically. That, that's why the name. And as I have said, the city is not confined to the central part. By the way, as you may see, Nizhny Novgorod is on the very same river of Volga, like Kazan. The city is a place where the river Aka flows into the river Volga. These are two big rivers, so there is a very beautiful place where one river falls into the other. We also have the, the major car factory called Gaz in uh, Novgorod. That's really one of the two major car factories in the country. That used to be a factory that was built similar to the Austin factory. While there was Grand Depression in America, people from America were coming to Nizhny Novgorod. The Americans were building this huge car factory from the ground up. They were producing trucks, passenger cars, military machines, obviously, all kinds of wheel machinery, wheeled machinery. We still have quite a lot of um, military production facilities, like we make submarines, but that's a secret. Don't tell anybody. Anyway, it's really awesome to visit city twice a year. In the coldest month of March and February, for example, and in the warmest, the brightest months of May, June, July, to see it the blossom and the summer life of the city. The city is full of visual contrast because of landscape. There's also a number of hills and anti-hills. I mean, the shallows. <laughs> there is a lot of uh, beautiful nature. Incredible view on the river and the hashtag would be, I have been putting it to the last, the hashtag which was said by the theater director from St. Petersburg. So he came from St. Petersburg to Nizhny Novgorod. And I would say that um, St. Petersburg is sort of an um, antipod, the nemesis of Nizhny Novgorod, because uh, St. Petersburg is the city of this, that was built after the will of a single person. It's the city of stone. And Nizhny Novgorod is a more chaotic city. It is sort of a wacky, the God's fool city. So <clears throat> to me, is the, and Nizhny Novgorod is kind of a wild forest. Because you can get lost in there. Find there some secret alcoves or dangerous swamps. And I don't mean any aggression from, the, uh, from different hooligans in the city or other marginal elements, although there are myths and legends about that in Nizhny Novgorod as well. The city is now used to tourists, of course, not as much as Kazan, we don't have that many tourists, but we do feel some sort of elevation in the city because nobody can travel now to Greece or Cyprus, so they go to the Volga region. People research the nearest cities. Moscow is far away by train, not far away, only four hours away by train from Nizhny Novgorod. You can get very quickly from Moscow to Nizhny Novgorod, just take a quick train ride and you're there. I'm glad to answer your questions and comments. Or share the impressions of colleagues who were in um, Nizhny Novgorod. Anybody wants to tell about their impressions in Nizhny Novgorod? Yes, indeed. We got to know Yakov uh, in August last year when we were traveling to Nizhny Novgorod to uh, the ceremony, the, the award ceremony of Innovation Award. That is the major contemporary art prize in Russia called Innovation. And there's also Kandinsky Prize. Yes. So, 
We have seen in Nizhny Novgorod the Soviet layer of history, because the city was called Gorky in the name of the famous Soviet writer. And we see this remnants of architectural modernism, the expressions of it, not only in the industrial buildings, but also in residential construction as well. And these remnants of modernism are not that explicit, especially if you're in the historic center of the city. Yet, this is the significant layer still. And I want to know about your attitude and how this is seen in the city. I love Nizhny Novgorod, specifically thanks to its very organic diversity. It's very eclectic, but naturally so. We have constructivism, even in the center of the city. We have modernism. We have uh, old wooden houses of the 16th century. Standing by. Can you hear me well? I think there's some interruption. Yes, you're being interrupted, but now it seems to be better. Are you with us, Yakov? Yes. I will open the door for better Wi-Fi. Yeah, that helped, actually. As odd as that seems. Yes, please do. Excuse me. Give me a sign if I am um, unlegible. We host a number of tours in the center of the city, guided tours. And there is a number of local law researchers who host those tours via open calls. And that is happening on a regular basis. And I believe that in the center of the city, it's well stable, it's stable and well predictable. It's easy to explore the center of the city. But as for the outskirts of the city where tourists normally do not go, we should say that right now we're hosting an exhibition called Gaps. I participate in that exhibition as an artist. And the mission of the exhibition to enlighten these dark gaps related to the history of the car factory and this utopian idea to create this perfect factory for machines and people when they're raised from the ground up this infrastructure for this new soviet human they were doing it in the 30s the paradox by the way is when they laid the first stone for the communal house as a part of the factory infrastructure there was supposed to be the cantina the kindergarten the communal apartments so all of the functions were supposed to be separated but communal in the very same day they released a statement to slow down the decree of the soviet government to slow down and not build infrastructure for this new human being. You see, this was the dead born child. And it still exists and it still lives. And artists are, are the first to contemplate on it and um, contemplate on this gaps and find this, the, the sense in them. There is a question. Yakov. Uh, it's a very Lucy, yes. It's a very simple question. I could also look it up on Wikipedia, but um, what's the population? And I was also curious about your relation to the city. If this is a place where you grew up, or if it's a place that you chose uh, now in the recent years. Thank you. Uh, population, from my point of view, is one million and two thousand. The thing is that uh, uh, I will tell you in Russian. 1.2 million of the population, as I said. The specifics is that many people who live in Nizhny Novgorod don't go to the center. I mean, it's a vast city. It's a sprawl city. So often you don't need to go to the center. There is all of the infrastructure where you live. And people only go to the center for some mass urban celebrations. 
but that happens rarely. Although that is powerful. So there's a feeling that every neighborhood is kind of small. You don't feel that you are in a vibrant one million population city. At the moment, I am in the place where I was pretty much born, where I grew up. This is the town of Chikalovsk. Chikalov was one of the first um, um, pilots who traveled over the North Pole from Russia to Canada. I moved to Nizhny Novgorod from the regional town of Chikalovsk when I was 17, before entering the university. And I have two homes. I have the apartment in Nizhny Novgorod, where I am a city dweller, and I have this wooden house in the town of Chikalovsk. I can walk here bare feet, swim in Volga every day, cut firewood, etc. I'm the village guy, <laughs> balancing the urban life. Okay, could you go into some more detail about how the studio is tied to Nizhny Novgorod? If Tikhaya studio, if Tikhaya studio could exist in a different city, could it? Moscow, Kazan, Samara, or there is inherent connection to Nizhny Novgorod and the entire thing would be completely different. Does that matter to you? Yes, thank you for the question. I mean, I am in the vacuum, I exist in the vacuum of my individual interpretation, including the things that I've said during the presentation when we were talking to Artyom. Well, I will reiterate, I feel that Tiche workshop is a very, very local thing. And even the name Tiche, which means tranquil, And it's named in the in the honor of uh, Tikhonovskaya Street. So, the workshop is very closely tied to the artist experience in the street. I mean, this is street art of Nizhny Novgorod, and the streets of Nizhny Novgorod do matter here and working with the, the brushes the working with the rollers and brushes in the city made us closer to the residents of the city make made us closer to the people we want our city to be complex and more attractive this is the experience we're enhancing, the experience of horizontal and interregional ties, linking to different communities in the city and communicating to institutions like the Museum of Contemporary Art Arsenal. We want our institution, which is not yet even opened, we want our institution to be tied to the experience that we acquired in Nizhny Novgorod. And it's great that artists can, artists can travel, can participate in residencies and work with galleries and exhibitions. And they can invite curators and artists in order to get to know one another and enrich one another. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, we have about two travel points, two geographical points. And I think, as far as I see, there are no questions. Okay, give me a sign if there are. Okay, good. Thank you for the story then. I suggest then we continue switch between or continue switching between Russia and Switzerland and travel to Zurich with the same questions. Let's see, let me show you the official emblem of your town, of your city, sorry, maybe I have something to say about it. I think it's as minimalistic emblem as possible. And could you please tell about 
how your city makes an impact on your work and your institution. If, uh, if I am correct, this is the emblem of Zurich. Is this correct? Yes, it is. It is. It's the emblem cool. of the city of Zurich as well as the canton of Zurich because the city of Zurich is the capital of the canton. Um, what you can see here clearly is a certain Protestant minimalistic aesthetics which um, I will speak about more. It's it's the hometown of a guy called Can you hear me? Yeah, no? Y yes, yes, yes. Please continue. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I've prepared some tabs. Um, yeah. So maybe I'm going to share my screen, but you will see that... Um, is blue and white, pretty much, pretty much um, represents the, the color that you see here a lot because there's a, a lot of water. And I think we also need a little bit of a break, right? Just a second, do you agree? Or are we like totally in, in, in time? Uh, I think we... We rush no. on? Нет, мне кажется, что нет. Нам нужен I перерыв. don't think there is... Do we need a break? I mean, there's no rush, but do we need a break, guys? Maybe not a break. Everybody, we have 45 minutes. I have an idea. Uh, I will, I will uh, start the video. Let's, it, it's okay. I just need to go to the toilet. That's all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can you can go. I mean, we have we have time. We learned yesterday, but, and uh, we have time. And what's nice is that I can uncommented uh, start the video, which I was planning to to watch with you anyway. So uh, rather than the the Google chronology of going from the large scale to the small scale, I'm going to take you right in. Uh, to the exhibition that I just curated, and that was running for um, April, May, June, uh, or April, May, beginning of June. And um, you will see the entrance door. You already see it on my screen. And I'll be back in two minutes, OK? OK. So here we go. Lucy, your mic is off. Exactly. And I just realized that I didn't give it to you with the sound. So I have to also sh screen share the sound. Sorry. So bad. OK, so we go again. And here is the video. Nope, that's another video. OK. Um, This is the video. So
diorama in part of his choreography. Lucy, you're on mute. You have to. Okay, so I just pause here and um, yes, uh, if you have questions, put them in the chat. And what we just saw here now is this archive of protest scenes from Hong Kong. We're inside the work called Health Scrape by Zhang Mahler and Tiffany Sia. And uh, the exhibition is called or was called Continuity Transpassing. making histories together in more than human worlds. It's the first exhibition uh, that I did so far. And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more in a second and take you now to Switzerland again. You hear me well? Everything okay? Yeah, yeah everything's okay. 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 Yeah, sorry, I really needed to just go to the toilet. Now I'm back with a good question. That's no problem. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Okay. So um, you can see here, uh, we're not very far from Liechtenstein, which would be somewhere around here-ish. Here's the canton of St. Gallen, and here's the Schendale in Zurich. And down here would be our colleagues of Neuchâtel around here. So all of this is part of a rather small region called Switzerland. And here we go. So here you see the lake. The lake is a somewhat important body of water for the Shed Holly, which you see is located right here at the lake side. As you can see here, there's two sides to the lake. On this side, we call it the Golden Coast. This is where Tina Turner lives and everybody else, like Roger Federer, is like the Geneva Lakeside Riviera, it's where the rich people live because they have all day sunshine. And this we call the, um, the, the coast where you have uh, the cold because of this, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter, internal joke, like um, where you catch a cold. It's not true, we still get a lot of sunshine. Uh, here is the city center, opera house. Um, there's another body of water, which is the river Limont, which goes like this. And then there's another river, which is called Seal, which you don't see here so well but now you see it. So there's quite a lot of water inside the city. Um, here they float together, but I'll just go to the Shed Halle now. And uh, so by bicycle from the center, you, it takes you maybe 10 minutes back here to this area. Wait a second, now I lost us. I lost this. Okay, let's go back. It's a little bit above here. Yes, no, I just, uh, I think I, I got on the wrong button. But you see the shed hole here is part of an um, area which is a former silk thread mechanical factory. And um, I will tell you about the history in a second. And here you see lots of Riviera swimming possibilities. This is the beach uh, where we swim in summer. This is the back door. This is really um, here. This is us. This is our part of the building. And then the rest of the factory, I'm showing you in a second. Um, chat. If there's anything important, maybe, yes. If there's anything important, uh, maybe just speak because I will not be able to oversee the chat. I'm jumping in historical time to show you um, the glacier, the Lind Glacier, which is um, how the region was actually built. So when you go back here and you see this lake, this is a former glacier and the hills around it are basically um, what the glacier transported from the mountains, which are back here, as you can see on the image. And um, there's something about this time before the human that I find particularly interesting. Um, then about emblems. There's also an emblem, which you call the Zurich lion. And there's also something I found 
and I, I can't tell you much more about the fact that it's just uh, uh, the animal of the city. So I think these animals, because here is the deer, which is also important for Zurich's mythology, the deer, the lion, the, dra the dragon maybe as well, they all seem to be reoccurring in these mythologies. And I was very inspired to hear all this, um, uh, yeah, to, to, you know, to talk about where, where you're speaking from through this emblematic thing. And when you look at the, um, Zurich emblem, which we saw before with the white and the blue, the city really, I, I was born here, I grew up here, and I always felt uh, it doesn't smell very much, like um, compared to other places that the city doesn't smell so much. Um, now I wonder if we just go back to the video and um, I will put it to the back side and show you this is the back side from where we were just before so this is the former factory and we're going to move out today uh, like February or in March now this is before <clears throat> And um, it's really amazing to be able to go out and have a break at this body of water. And there's here, we're going to just see one of the residents that was there three weeks in February, going in through the back door a few days before the opening. Our back entrance, and just before the video that I started to show you here, is taking us to the uh, front door of the house. Now I'm gonna put down the sound, and just uh, you will see these works. Um, if you're interested in anything more detailed, we'll look at the web page in a second. There's altogether eight pieces that are here in this space, um, and the eight positions are. The, the way it's exhibited, it's a lot about movement and the way the works make you perceive the space. So it's not one piece after another, but it's more they're overlapping because um, this underline, the undertitle of the exhibition, so making histories together in more than human worlds, all the positions that I invited have been um, deeply engaged with one form of a more than human entity or material. Um, this can be spirits or um, different, um, that, like there's someone that, who walked uh, the, the, the paintings that you will see in a second. Um, you will notice what I'm talking about when, when it gets closer. There's uh, there's an artist, Patrick Kroner, who has a practice where the, the object is taking over 10 years until it's finished. So his more than human relation is the one to the Alps or to the, to the rocks, to the minerals. Is these three large scale paintings that you see in the background. Uh, the piece with the passage that we're looking at right now is by Inat Maruf. You take me across the distance. Um, he's a dancer who has started to make a video work and the uh, person who we saw in the video before. The piece that in his, uh, and then there's the, the, the Hong Kong artists, um, Zeng Mahler with Tiffany Sia, their modern human relation is with an algorithm because the images that we saw are all generated by an algorithm that was trained on a Google search that was conducted on the three and five prominent sites of the Hong Kong protests. And they were built into these landscape loops. And this uh, sculpture you see here is Rika Tauriainen's Confluences, which she's been working with this pet material for a while and has developed it further. Okay, now I am... Oh. Seriously. You cannot uh, no, no uh, when the, the sound was on, that then was a problem. But when the sound of the video off, yes, you can hear you. So can it's you okay. No, yeah, yeah, yes. 
good. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay. I think well, you, you can just play the video without the sounds and it's okay. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. So uh, we were here. I'm going to just quickly stop because um, I'll go out of the video again. And how much time do I have? Just so I know where I am. I think we have 10 minutes for, for your talk and, and questions. Okay. 10 more? Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to pause here quickly because there's something I also prepared. This... Um, because I want to talk, uh, because of course I want to tell you a little bit more about um, the Shedhalle and the history of the Shedhalle, which I think is important. Uh, so here, to remind us, this is our logo and our speaker. And maybe I don't need to screen share for this. No, I think it's too distractive if I'm sh showing uh, images. So I think I'm just going to talk uh, the, through the history of Rote Fabric. Okay. So Rote Fabric, um, uh, oh, before that, I have to speak about Zurich, of course. Um, I think most of the cliches that you will know about, the st stereotypes um, will be true. Um, it is a commercial center. Its population is 600,000 people, but um, the pulse of the city is very fast. So I always feel um, what this thing I said about it's so clean, it doesn't smell. Um, it's a highly efficient place with a very strong working, um, working ethic. So this day starts very early and there are parts of the city where the cleaning machine goes through twice. So it's really neurotically um, interested in, 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 in cleanness, I think, and in, in being very, um, efficient. There is also a very, I would call it like a counterculture. So um, in a sense, the pulse is fast. Um, it's a very um, gentrified city. And there's somewhat a overproduction also culturally, apart from the opera house, the Schauspielhaus, the Kunsthaus, um, very large scale institutions. There's uh, a large scale privatized gallery system, places like Hauser and Wirt, Luma, everybody's sitting here, a little bit like Basel, um, it has another history. There is um, the Mikro Museum, the Kunsthaus, the, Kunst, uh, the Kunsthalle. So for us, which I will speak about in a second, the Schedhalle, what are we uh, facing? We're facing an oversaturated provincial town with um, so much. Um, and, and of course, I didn't even start to speak about the off spaces. So how, how to um, provide uh, a place where people really feel they're welcome and they, they want to come. Um, so Rote Fabrik is a place that was built in 1892. It's uh, this mechanical silk weaving mi mill. And there was a moment in the 20th century, maybe to go back to the 19th century, because a lot of the old money in Zurich comes from textile industry. A lot of the wealth in Switzerland starts in the 18th century with tourism or somehow this discovery of the um, aesthetic experience of nature. So there's something about modernity which makes Switzerland this very particular successful model, um, which in a sense, uh, in a nutshell, you find a lot of things that um, would apply to other places as well, but somehow here they're so visible. And I always wondered if that's because I grew up here or because um, I grew up here, and that's maybe important to say, um, as a second generation um, immigrant. So my grandmother was born in St. Petersburg, but she was already then uh, transferred to Prague. Uh, my parents came to Zurich in 1968. So I grew up speaking Czech at home, and then this outside world was always a bit bizarre. Um, so I have a, like a distanced view, and I left as soon as I could, and I've come back. And Rote Fabrik, for example, has been a place that I really, um, that nourished my, my, my cultural knowledge as being an alternative, a counterculture, providing um, somewhat, um, yeah, alternatives. So 1892, part of this, um, you know, Switzerland starting 
be more rich and Zurich having more money. Textile industry, Rote Fabrik, then in the 20th century um, was bought by the city in the 70s because they wanted to build a highway. This highway through that area was never built. So the city had this area, which was just like this whole, um, you know, this whole um, uh, rather vast um, 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 areal of the Rote Fabrik, which was uh, not used. So um, what happened then was that uh, Pantro culture became stronger in the 70s. And by the 80s, there was uh, a squat and uh, they negotiated pretty well. And I think it was in the, uh, there's a youth uh, unrest in the 80s in Switzerland, which is called Zurich is Burning, which was very successful in fighting the battle. And then uh, Rote Fabrik became a cultural center, an official cultural center, uh, a cooperatively organized um, structure. What's interesting uh, also maybe to say about Zurich is this strong counterculture movement also in the 90s. Of course, it's a super important place for techno and any kind of, um, um, you know, electronic music. Um, and these things are still happening, but they happen otherwise. Like I often wonder nowadays, where are the spaces of counterculture? And I think they're much more in hacking or they're much more in providing space to hang out. And um, the Rote Fabrik, uh, eventually, then Shed Halle uh, was was uh, built in 1985. They founded themselves as a self-organized artist exhibition space, which then, by the 90s, was taken over some prominent people like uh, Renate Lawrence, which, with Pauline Baudry, was um, representing Swiss Switzerland at the Biennale in Venice some years ago. Marianne von Ostern. All these people responsible for the 90s, let's say, educational turn in the arts, where discourse and research are like huge um, paradigms that change the way we make exhibition and understand art making, which um, I think today has to really be revised. And um, it was important then, but I would uh, uh, observe something like a turn, which we could call an affective turn since the zero years, which nowadays have much more uh, is showing in interpretations like I would say the the Shedhole is doing now, hashtag neo avant-garde two zero, you know, um, how to in this overproduction, oversaturation, and I would even say like over academicization of the arts, how to uh, flatten it out again and make it more from the heart, make it more simple, make it accessible without simplifying. Uh, so uh, the things I spoke about yesterday about the ethics and um, maybe also really. Mm, having the courage to appear naive, like be strategically naive and um, call, call for something like uh, devotion, gentleness, kindness, uh, that that's maybe the smarter move nowadays than to insist on being the smartest person in the room and having like waterproof concepts. So it's maybe a little excursion. Um, yes. Now, I would um, maybe use, so what needs to be maybe said as well, uh, is that I'm going to just like screen share again because um, I think it's nice to see imagery. Lucy, we have two minutes, and if you don't mind, maybe we can. Oh, uh, Christy, which one I shall go read Okay, I just want uh, yes. Say, say. What did you want to uh, do? Просто, Let's если... combine the two minutes that we have left with questions, if you are okay with that. So yes. please write so, questions if you have them. I'm going to show you the website where you can see everything that I've spoken about. This is the exhibition, blah, 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 and all the positions that I've just now quickly jumped over. But I need to share this link because I'm very excited about this link. Um, it's a book called I'll Be Here in Sunshine and in Shadow, and it's uh, telling the story of what would have happened if Lenin would have not left for Russia because he was in Zurich before. And this is, uh, you see it on my screen, it's a Wikipedia link, I will post it in the chat. And for anybody interested in um, great literature and books, it's really great. Um, and I think it just fits so well <clears throat> for our uh, relationship of finding weird links between Switzerland and Russia. So I needed to share that plus because now we talked about the mainstream things. Um, so the mainstream, let's say, 
the obvious things you would see. There's a lot of things that are not obvious about this town. For example, this is a link to a library here, like the central normal uh, library of the city of Zurich, the university library. And then they have like special collections, which is this collection, which I think makes a link to the para knowledges. It's an official um, library for occult knowledge. And even people that live here don't know about it. And so if you ever... Lucy, простите, я не хочу вас прерывать. Это очень Sorry, увлекательно. Lucy, but I don't want to interrupt you, but we don't have enough time. And uh, we want to listen to your hashtag and we would move to Novosibirsk. Okay, Neo Avantgarde uh, 2.0. I'm so sorry. I totally made a bit of a non-linear. Uh, could you please write that yes. in our chat? Thank you very much for your talk. Now we would move to Novosibirsk. Piotr, you are the one, the last picture for you that I prepared. And your coat of arms, please tell us, does it tell anything about the place where you live, how is it connected to your institution or not connected at all, please? Thank you very much for your question and for a nice format that we could go from the, these coat of arms. It's amazing that we could touch those topics. For example, the coat of arms, Zheliznagorsk and Krasnoyarsk, I really know. Definitely, um, so you know, those are two stables. So this is the river Op, a Siberian river. We would come back to that river. So there is a bridge between two sides of the city that marks the emerge of the city because it's a young city, a young one. It's not even 130 years and 1 million and 500 people live here, even more. Uh, it was, you know, raised during the Soviet Union times. So it was created in 1993 and the last 20 years there were some attempts to interpret it but maybe redo it somehow because we have it in public spaces as well. But citizens, they feel different about that. Can I demonstrate my my screen? Yeah, while I was we were discussing that, I was googling that. I can say that I was even attracted to the process of searching for those pictures. So I'm improvising right now. Do you see? This is the uh, permanent ice uh, situation in Russia. So it's like the map. Yeah. We are located in Siberia, but we don't have eternal frost. But some people come here and ask for it. Where is Taiga? Where are the leftovers of um, so of mammoths? But we live in a transit zone between because it characterizes us in Siberia because the city appears not just thanks to the bridge, but also as the infrastructure project of the end of uh, Russian Empire. It was a working village uh, that would be working for this Siberian road. And it's important for Novosibirsk to understand that the river is here. Uh, and it's true for the code of arts but I really love another one and I would show it to you. So in public spaces, we have that with stables, you know, yeah, it looks like that. So there are other Siberian cities like Krasnoyarsk, Irkutsk, Bernaul and so on, different sides of the world. Everyone hates that monument and I suppose it's going to be ruined, even though it's almost in the city center but the art committee that was organized, um, he's a communist, 
which is quite rare for Russia and, you know, elections of the mayor, it's quite rare. So now it's possible, so they decided to get rid of it. I suppose the old code of arts will stay, but yeah, you know, I would show you just a second. I'm more happy about that code of arts. It, it was created in 1870. It's a simple one. It doesn't have any common with geraldic norms. So there is a view as well. So it's kind of a traditional thing for Russian code of arts, of arms. So there are... I'm sorry, in the evening it's 11. I, I don't really think in a nice way. I, I don't, I can't think right now. So it's a mechanic detail and they are combined with a spike. So it's like um, science and working and the fire inside. So this is the torch of revolution that is quite understandable here that was once lighted up. Now it's kind of frozen in 1919, 1919 there was a civil war and during the propaganda program during the administration program the citizens of Niva Nikolaevsk it was the uh, former city of it was the former name of the city they created this monument so and the this is like uh, this cemetery for for revolutionaries and they decided to make a monument here it's an amazing square but you can't really get there all the time. It's a hidden place, I would say. And the flame, it, you know, is just concrete. We had no professional sculptor, just an engineer and a student that were creating that monument. And citizens, they just gave money for that. So. There was a special thread inside the monument, so there was a lamp in the flame to make it, you know, bright. So this torch, it was, it created a perspective for Novosibirsk, because before revolution, the meaning of the city wasn't really important, but then in 20s it became a really important administri administrative center like Kazan, especially during the World War II, and because a lot of factories have been evacuated there, and a lot of scientists as well. So this is the city center, the opera house here. I really love that we have the opera city here in the city center, because it was projected like a, a house of science to, you know, observe different events in this particular place. But in reality, in Paris, it is like a neoclassical building where you could see the opera and the ballet. And even now it's the opera and, and ballet house. But if we look at the project, it looked like a modern mystic building it has a big sphere it is made for creating different projections and people could collectively learn about the skies for example learning geography whatever so some kind of typical Soviet Union ideas about being modern and total spread of knowledge. So everyone would gather together and everyone would understand what we're talking about and get to know some new ideas. So we have a lot of constructivism here. And lately there is a lot more um, about popularity of constructivism. So the idea is about the transgression of those materials and now we could see that 
we can see them like monuments we try so people try to save them from one side it's amazing from the other it's quite like a paradox you could see even places for sunbathing on the roof how can we call that i don't remember so there are so the, there were a lot of them because in winter it's minus 35 and now it's plus 25 and plus 35 in summer so you could see the difference in temperatures so the building not far away from CK19 CC19 so the administrative building not far away from the square so the administration is there it's located in the beginning of 20s and 30s everything was built uh, so it is the prom band uh, so now this is the building of administration and mayor is sitting there in 1895 there was nothing and in 40 years there are almost 100 people and now if Yakov Korev asks me about hashtags I would tell that I would think about that I would tell the first thing that comes up to my mind is acceleration and the second is potential I can't really understand, I can't really find other words. A bit of opera house as well. So you could see it's so fancy, like uh, celebrities. So it's kind of another ideological paradigm and we live with that, we stick with that right now. So. we can't really hide away from the from that but we have some bright moments so i would like to tell you about my hometown about akadem garadok this is like the area uh, a part of novosibirsk and it's a bit to the south like 30 kilometers from novosibirsk um, my grandmothers and my grandparents were, were raised there they came there to build it and in which it looks like that so people live there and more than 30 scientific researchers um, researching laboratories geology physics a bit of humanitarian science but not a lot uh, historians philosophers they take one side of the building and the other side takes like KGB, you know, FBI in Russia. So they share the building. Nevertheless, Akadem Garadok is now not that. Uh, when it appeared in the 60s, it was really popular. There were unbelievable things happening there in a house of scientists it's a card from congress from a library of congress in a gallery of scientists there were you you couldn't imagine in 60s and 70s like the abstract pictures being there it's impossible to imagine so and nevertheless, it was it was possible in Academic Gardok to you know discuss those things and print them. So it was due to Yelisevsky White because she was there as well. And and uh, you know, young people they were so active there. I I would stay with that slide here because it can the first modernism and the second one after the war they're combined here in Novosibirsk the different dimensions of of this utopian potential that 
was there, you know, um, paying attention to the heritage. There was an attempt to renew the aesthetics and ask how can we live together. We wouldn't we would live together in families but we need to understand at what kind of level we uh, it could be really um, non-violent in the beginning there was a segregation of scientific status so if you're an academic you have a big house if you are a phd you have an apartment at the first line and if you're just working at the department but maybe you would live at the dormitory for example you know but it's not a fact so it was what happened with us so those moments of renovation of changing of social life there were some objective condition conditions that we had to face so Novosibirsk for me is like a it's like a utopia for me, and they are not quite successful, and we are at the ruins of this utopia. And I told everyone yesterday why CC is like Tseka in Russian because we really appreciate communication, especially talking about the second. We would we try to follow big cultural programs that appeared in the city and there was an auction an international one popularization of russian language it's called uh at all like test so someone is writing the text of uh, left-sided ideology and everyone writes the text to understand the grammar but i understand that now um this program it doesn't work really well because they don't have enough finances so it happens all over the country and demonstrations everything is connected to discourse because Novosibirsk is not is not a, a Siberian kind of um, movement so there is some political movement here at the regional level and it is connected because with the fact that people try to ask questions to each other you know we don't have central sources we don't have oil gas or gold whatever we are like the harbor here that is why at the crossroads of free roads we have to communicate and agree where we are going and we are in the constant discussion here so the goal of the communication is is something with the help of which we could perceive the life and how could we work with the imagination so talking about the context the physical one we could come back maybe we could combine questions and the presentation because yeah we would need to turn off the microphone and ask questions and i would like to ask from myself it's quite obvious that there is a lot of material that artists could work with from Novosibirsk and the CC19 that you pre represent. Does it work with those nar narratives? The artists from the communities that you know? Yes, of course. Now, now I don't have the examples. The, the story of Utopia is a very important thing and um, it was worked with a lot especially the last 25 years before it wasn't that you know spread and now people acknowledge that and a lot of projects appear like the festival 48 hours in the Sibirsk so half of the projects they are at the hybrid level that artists go to a new neurophysiologist and try to communicate with the locals to grow knowledge this is amazing 
So the picture that you could see, it's like the op C. If you if you ever been to academic academic городок, you could see that scene. In summer, it could look like that. In sixties, it it really looked like that. Now it doesn't happen to be like that, but it my it is my uh, granddad's picture. So it is connected to a biography. Sorry for sorry for interrupting you. So I suppose to, it is over for our YouTube channels, and now we will discuss everything in a closed format. Thank you very much for seeing our trans so our stream. Goodbye. <laughs> so now you could continue. Maybe no one is interested right now anymore. Everybody is interested. And I think that people who were watching us in the stream, they also upset that we switched it off. <laughs> so we have a raised hand here. Lucy, okay? Yes, thank you so much. It's extremely interesting. I have a question. Um, Anton Karmanov, is that someone you've been working with? Uh, yeah, last year he, um, yeah, it would be easy in English, I guess. Yeah, uh, last year he co-curated a show uh, about Soviet modernism uh, in, in CC19. He was a curator of a local extent.